Hello and welcome to Ogmore by Sea Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's really great that you can join me as we continue to read through the book of Acts. That's the book of the Bible that we're reading through together during October 2024. We've reached chapter 22. I'll try to very briefly get us up to speed, but there are previous reading sessions on the church YouTube channel that you can check out if you can bear it. But we ought to pray before all of that. So please would you pray with me. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you. That's what we're about right now. As we read scripture, as we read uh, this book of Acts, we want to hear your voice. We come to you. So Father, we pray that you would speak to us because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I need to poke myself in the face with my glasses then. Uh, right, so very briefly... The story has been following the Apostle Paul. The Lord has chosen him, set him apart, equipped him to be the messenger of the good news to the world, to the Gentiles. His pattern on his missionary journeys has been first going to the synagogues, but eventually he'd get booted out and he'd go next door or meet somewhere else. And he'd tell uh, all the people that would hear about the good news of Jesus, explaining that Jesus is the Messiah, and not just explaining, reasoning, persuading from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah who had to suffer and be raised on the third day, that the Lord, the Father, has shown that Jesus is the man appointed to judge the living and the dead by raising him from the dead, and he's going to return. And all of this, he's, he's preached, but it is stirred up trouble. It has caused revival and riots in various places. And the most heated opposition has been from the Jewish leaders. And so Paul was traveling back to Jerusalem and all his companions and the churches that he planted were warning Paul and urging him not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul knew that suffering lay ahead of him in Jerusalem, but he went there anyway. Now, there was this fake news spreading that Paul had been speaking against the temple and the law of Moses and trying to dissuade Jewish believers from observing the law. And so there was this plan for Paul to take on a vow to pay for others to have their hairs cut and go through this very Jewish custom to show that Paul is kosher. There's nothing to fear. However, that doesn't really solve the problem is because that really wasn't the issue in the first place. They know that it's fake news. They know that this is an accusation, but in order to stop him doing what they really hate, which is telling people the good news of Jesus, which is bringing people out from under the control of the Jewish leaders. So that's where we're up to. And now there's a riot going on and the Apostle Paul is, has turned to speak to the crowd and he addresses them in Aramaic. That's like the, the heart language, the mother tongue of the Jewish people. He ha he's, has to be carried out of the situation because it's so fierce. So that's where we find ourselves. And this is what Paul has to say in his defense. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought, but brought up in this city. And he's in Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel, and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. We've met Gamaliel earlier on in the book of Acts. He was the one who advised the Sanhedrin not to kill all the apostles. But he said, if it's of God, then you won't be able to stop it. So, and he gave examples of people who have individuals who made a name for themselves, had a following, but then they died and then it dissipated. And Gamaliel says, let's just wait and see. Like Jesus has been killed. Let's see if it peters out. 
or else they might be finding themselves fighting against God. So Gamaliel, he is all he was also the the rabbi, the mentor of Paul, according to the law. So he was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. He goes beyond that, actually, in what he writes in 2 Corinthians and Galatians. He says he surpasses everyone when it comes, if you were going to look at his CV. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. Which is probably why they wanted Paul dead so much. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. Notice how he's bringing out the Jewishness of it. Because trusting in Jesus is the most Jewish thing anyone can do. (laughs) He is the Messiah. He is the one promised. He's the one born of Judah. He is the lion of Judah. And so he mentions his own Jewish upbringing, his own uh, observance of the law and training in it, and his own persecution of the way because of his commitment to the law of Moses. And then when it comes to his conversion, realizing that Jesus is the promised Messiah, when Ananias, well, the way he describes Ananias is a devout observer of the law, highly respected by all the Jews living there. So this isn't like a new thing that came in. Like the light has been switched on for Paul, realizing that this is the culmination of the law. Right, verse 13. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have heard, sorry, of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. And it's the mention of the Gentiles, because as I pointed out in the previous reading session, this looks very similar to the tribal hooliganism of Ephesus when they were chanting about great Artemis of the Ephesians and now the Jews who are getting at Paul view the living God of Israel in the same way as the Ephesians thought of the false God of Artemis, this needy God and its us and them mentality. So it's the mention of the Gentiles. 
which is interesting, isn't it? It's not the mention of Jesus being the living God. It's the fact that the Lord would send send his messenger to the Gentiles. Verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and fight, flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realised that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. There's a couple of things going on here. Paul is not just trying to get out of suffering. We know from his writings that he considers it a an honour to suffer for the sake of Jesus, which is bonkers, but that ought to be our own perspective as well. Like, it is a privilege to suffer for Jesus, if that's what the Lord wills. We're not to seek it out. So he's not doing that. He is playing this card of his Roman citizenship in order for, for further audience to preach the good news. There's a platform to preach the good news. And he realises that at this point, he's being seen as the problem that needs to get rid of as well. And this is mob justice at work, isn't it? It's the mob who have to get him, and he's the one being punished. And so there is, like, there's justice going on here, and it's just as well that... Paul has, can play the Roman citizen card. But I think behind this as well, do you notice how often the mention of being a, a citizen or a Roman citizen and the, the respect, the protection, the honour, all of that entails? I think there's an irony going on here with the commander and the centurion's deep reverence for the citizenship of this little empire. Whereas Paul is, Paul and every other Christian is actually far more honoured and to be revered because they are part of an eternal kingdom. They are princes and princesses children of the living God. I think that's something that's going on here. Like Paul, as a Jew, is sadly just despised, and he's going to be flogged and interrogated without a trial. But a Roman citizen, they're like, whoa. But the thing is, Jesus says every single person is worth more than the whole world, whether they're Jew or Gentile. And, yeah, believers, I, I don't think we, we consider just the privilege place that we have in Christ, by his grace, enough. And each other. Like, there wouldn't be bickering in church and backfighting and infighting, and, yeah, fool acts, if we realise just how precious we are each are to God. Sorry, I got sidetracked. But the mention of citizenship, I think that's kind of what's going on here. Also, Paul's going to give his testimony again in a little while. We already hear it in chapter 9, 
And when, when God keeps on repeating something in scripture, I think it's probably a hint that it's quite important. Yes, there are different reasons why it's being shared, but nonetheless, I think it's important. So like the tabernacle, you know, you hear how it is going to be made, you hear how it was made, and then you hear it functioning. It's repeated. It's important. And the same with Paul's story of faith in Jesus and his ministry. Verse 30. Let's get back to the scriptures. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Uh, there must be some kind of joke in there about Avengers assemble, but they're not so much Avengers, are they? Right. Then he brought Paul and set him before them. That seems fair, doesn't it? <laughs> the whole Sanhedrin, they want this guy dead. And then just Paul. But is it just Paul? Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wool. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realise that he was the high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, so there's a couple of ways of thinking about that. Maybe he was dressed in his uh, normal clothes, not in his big gown, whatever. Or maybe Paul is just subtly pointing out that he is no high priest at all. He's forsaken that role that he had because he is not bringing people to God and he's not bringing God to people. He is abusing the role completely. And yet he, Paul is also saying uh, that he knows the scriptures, he obeys the scriptures and he doesn't want to go against the scriptures, which again highlights that Ananias, the so-called high priest, doesn't care whether he violate, violates the law or not. Uh, and again, we've been pointing out parallels of Jesus with Paul, and it is reminiscent, isn't it, of Jesus before the council. And yeah, speaking to the high priest then. Verse 6, then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So I love that. Paul had just told his story of coming to faith in Jesus and it involved Jesus confronting him on the road to Damascus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because Jesus is Emmanuel, the one who feels the pain of his people as his own pain. He's with his people. He's God with us. And now, by the grace of God, Paul belongs to Jesus and Jesus stands with Paul in this amazing way. 
So there's comfort and there's courage here, isn't it? Knowing that Jesus is with him. Why did Paul throw in this <laughs> spanner <laughs> into the... I think it's probably... Well, I think it's pretty clever. He knows that he's not getting a fair trial. And he knows <laughs> that this is like tribalism at work and jealousy. And so he, with the wisdom that God gives him, he turns those who are against him against each other. Because he knows what the Sanhedrin are like. So he says, I'm a Pharisee, and it's because of the resurrection. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. The Lord works in so many different ways through the book of Acts. And... It makes me recognise that the Lord can work in any number of ways. He sends angels to deliver people out of prison. He just strikes Herod dead in a moment. But the way that he normally chooses to work is through people. He chooses this way. He could have sent an angel to the commander, but he chooses... Who is it? The nephew of, yeah, Paul's nephew, Paul's sister, the son of Paul's sister, to go. It's interesting, isn't it? And, yeah, that's the way that God works out his will. Much more could be said, but for time's sake, we're going to keep on going. Verse 23, then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be sa taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias to his excellency, Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. <laughs> is that really is that really the way it happened? There is a bit of spin and self-preservation going on there, isn't there? Like he was seized by the Jews, and this guy, Claudius L Lysias, says, I came to the rescue. <laughs> And in fact, he was the one who put him in the stocks and was about to flog him and interrogate him. Anyway, he did kind of rescue him, but there is certainly spin. Uh, verse 28. I wanted to know why they were accusing him. So I brought him to their Sanhedrin 
I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. So there we go. We're going to have to leave it there for now. But it's amazing that this is the way that the Lord chooses. To let the kings of the earth know. It's through weakness. It's through accusations. It's through being put on trial. The Lord chooses to do that. There's a cross shape. Yeah, our salvation is through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the way that he gets the message of the cross and salvation out to the world is also cross shaped. We see that in Paul's trials here. Thank you so much for joining me. I pray this is a blessing to you. May you have courage as you know Jesus Emmanuel with you as you testify to the truth. God bless and I'll see you soon.